Manku. One of the Textile Museum of Canada's most recent acquisitions is a collection of 181 printed fabrics designed by artists, Inuit artists at Knight Studios in Cape Dorset. These were made during the experimental years when Cape Dorset's famous print program was just beginning. Donated to the TMC in 2017 by Dorset Fine Arts, the marketing division of the Inuit-run West Bath and Eskimo Cooperative, the collection is a physical record of a relatively short-lived fabric printing initiative undertaken in the studios of Cape Dorset. We would like to acknowledge the Inuit artists and printers who designed and produced these remarkable works 60 years ago, and those who have contributed their knowledge of this fabric printing enterprise. No other public collection of Inuit printed textiles is known in Canada. The TMC is embracing the responsibility of bringing more awareness to Inuit cultural heritage, creating broad access through exhibition, publication and online resources, and educational programs in partnership with Inuit cultural community and research leaders. During the 20th century in the Canadian Arctic, government policies and the, revival, the arrival of the Hudson Bay Company forced traumatic changes to the Inuit way of life, and the families went from living on the land to living in settlements. During this difficult period of cultural upheaval, Inuit scholar and curator Heather Iguilarte maintains that it was the Inuit artists who preserved much of the intergenerational knowledge by recording in their artworks what they were discouraged from or forbidden to practice in their communities. Legends, spirit world, and oral histories now accessed through stone sculpture and graphic print and textile arts. Cape Dorset, population around 1500, is situated on Dorset Island, one of a series of small islands connected at low tide to Baffin Island in Nunavut. The word Eskimo has been historically used to describe the Inuit throughout their homeland in Arctic regions of Alaska, Greenland, and Canada. It is now considered derogatory in Canada and has been widely replaced by the term Inuit, or terms specific to a particular group or community. In this presentation, you will hear it used when it is part of the name of an organization. Building on a centuries-old Inuit graphic tradition, printmaking was introduced in Cape Dorset in 1957 as part of a larger government program initiated by James Houston, an artist and civil administrator, to encourage handicraft production for sale in the South as an economic incentive for Inuit who were making the transition from subsistence hunting and trapping to a wage economy in settled communities. By the 1960s, the West Bath and Eskimo Co-op Studio, a majority-run Inuit business, had a number of Inuit artists who regularly contributed to the Cape Dorset print program, which included a commercial hand-printed fabric enterprise. However, the origins of Inuit printmaking go further back in time. Since 1948, James Houston has been working to establish a formal marketing structure, had been working, uh, for Inuit art, which at that time included mainly stone and ivory sculpture, basketry, and sewn handicrafts. Among these were skin pictures, an important antecedent to paper printmaking. Made with meticulous workmanship by Inuit women for sale, these skin pictures consist of applique images sewed from bleached and unbleached seal or caribou skin. Designs cut from fabric and applied to another piece of fabric is a traditional method of decorating skin clothing. They were produced from at least 1951, and some effort was made to market them. In 1956, in a meeting of the Canadian Handicrafts Guild, James Houston explained his plan to, quote, teach 12 Eskimos to make stone blocks for use in hand-blocking yard goods, using designs native in character, unquote, and showed the Guild some preliminary examples of block-printed fabric with Arctic-themed designs that the studio had been working on during the spring of that year. These images of fabric printmaking in the studio from the late 1950s show examples of fabrics with repeating arctic motifs, birds, polar bears, and hunters. 
As a logical extension of the fabric block printing done in 1956, in 1957, the studio began printing paper gift cards and wrapping paper in its efforts to, re to produce low-cost but handmade sale items. The craft experiments continued, and one of the studio's, studio's earliest known fine art prints is Three Caribou, designed by Niviasi and printed by Kanaganak, dated November 20, 1957. Although James Houston initiated the program, it was Terry Ryan who worked with the artists to ensure its continued success. Hired by the co-op in 1960, he provided the organization with more than 30 years of continuous leadership and astute advice. According to Bill Ritchie, the current co-op manager, Ryan left no stone unturned in the quest for a viable creative enterprise that would reflect the beautiful artwork produced by the Dorset artists. The studio continued with the fabric printing experiments and also attempted a commercial hand-printed fabric enterprise. Unlike stone or ivory and ivory sculpture and the famous prints which have become collected and appreciated the world over, there is very little existing information or documentation of the hand-printed textile initiative. Through material and technical analysis, archival research and interviews with those who have been involved in some capacity in the fabric printing experiments, we've been able to uncover some more pieces of the story which we will present today. This is a breakdown of the materials in the museum's fabric collection. The majority of them are linen or cotton. The experiments also included testing printing methods. The earliest technique attempted was block printing beginning in 1956. There are two examples of block printing in the collection, the remaining are silk screen printed. In an effort to bring greater knowledge of printmaking to the Arctic, in 1958 James Houston spent four months in Japan studying block printing under the Japanese master Kenichi Hiratsuka. Houston returned bringing Japanese printmaking tools and paper and taught the technique to the printmakers at Cape Dorset. In 1960, 12 members of the co-op decided to expand their activities into a larger business. They saved $30,000 from the sale of soapstone carvings and simple sketches to get the business on its feet. In 1963, the fabric printing studio was built, and Olga Tchaikovsky, a designer from the Toronto College of Art, spent the summer in the Dorset Print Shop and Craft Centre, introducing the graphic artist to the silk screen process. For the next two years, Kananganak and others continued to experiment. He perfected his knowledge of the silkscreen technique and was responsible for printing a group of designs that won National Design Awards later on. This image is one of the screens that was used to make prints in Cape Dorset, and the design, as you can see on the right, is by an unknown artist and is in the TMC collection. The following slides are some examples of experiments and in incomplete prints. <coughs> and showing the stage as a screen printing. And another uh, two designs of one um, fabric. There are 95 individual designs in the fabric collection, and we have identified the work of 17 artists, mostly women. These artists were, for the most part, well-known established print artists. According to the Canadian Industrial Designs Database, there were 51 designs registered by the co-op between 1965 and 1969. 28 of those are represented in the collection. As we have identified 95 individual designs, that would suggest that a large portion of the collection consists of experimental designs that may never be put into production. Most of the pieces in the collection have no identification markings. One example, Friendly Well, Wales, shows the name of the artist, Obalu Tunli, the title of the print and registered marking on the salvage. A few others have the artist and print title handwritten on the fabric with a marker or pen. There are two examples of signatures or chops which appear on the block printed fabrics. The chop in syllabics is based on a Japanese model used to stamp the prints and includes from top down the symbol of the artist, then the printmaker, and the bottom is a studio. 
the Kate Dorset Studio is represented by an igloo. Other pieces were identified from published sources. Future re research should make it possible to determine the artists of those remaining identified prints. These two, this slide and the following slide, present examples of stone cut prints on the left and fabric prints on the right by the same artists and suggest that rather than artists making drawings specifically for fabric printing, as in the case of artists Parr and Shunga Talk, motives from existing drawings for paper printing were used and modified for use on fabric, but this is yet to be determined. Richly layered with meaning, these designs express the enduring values that Inua described to the land, animals, old ways of life, and depict stories and legends known only through oral memory. So I'm going to share some of the information we found about where and how the fabrics were marketed in the mid-1960s okay. <laughs> um, mid and the evolution of the experiment from hand-printed yardage to fashion design in the 1970s. At the first conference of the Arctic Cooperatives held in 1963, the cooperatives asked the federal government and the Cooperative Union of Canada to set up a marketing organization to distribute the work of Inuit artists. To this end, Canadian Arctic producers, or CAP, was established in 1965. CAP staff traveled throughout Canada, the United States, and Europe, promoting Inuit products. In the summer of 1966, John Patton, the sales manager of the Fabrics Division, toured across Canada with the Cape Dorset Textiles. Patton presented samples of 12 designs, including Pars <coughs> Proud Geese, Obilu Tunali's Friendly Whales, Inukshuakshu's Many Eskimos, Pudlu's Spirits and Birds, and Mary Samueli's Fish and Shadows. These samples are all printed by Kanaganak. Patton's tour was the first time the fabrics were shown publicly. They were met with a very positive reaction. Uh, Toronto Star journalist Mary Moreau called them brilliantly executed, and Patton reported that, quote, the reception in Ontario and across the prairies has been excellent. If promises turn into orders, the Eskimos will have a lot of work on their hands. Two years after the silkscreen printing on fabric was undertaken at Cape Dorset, the designs were entered into a national design competition. The Design 67 awards were initiated by the Department of Industry and the National Design Council to, quote, encourage increased production and sale of well-designed Canadian products and stimulate the development of new designs for Canada's centennial celebrations and Expo 67, the World's Fair, which would take place in Montreal in the summer of 1967. The Design Awards placed a particular emphasis on new design development by offering monetary awards and creating opportunities to match products with manufacturers. The West Bath and Eskimo Co-op submitted 12 designs by artists into the new product category. Their submission reads as follows. Unbleached linen fabric featuring various silkscreen designs available in 36 inch and 42 inch widths for an estimated cost of $5.95 to $10 per yard. The fabrics were accepted into the new product category and won one of 58 awards for exceptional new designs. The co-op received a $1,000 award intended to help defray the cost of prototype development. Only 14 of the designs were awarded $1,000 or more, which suggests that the co-op's fabrics represented some of the best and most promising designs in the competition. Winning the award resulted in a significant amount of exposure for the fabrics. They were featured at Design 67 Design Marts, held in Toronto, Montreal, and Vancouver. Information sheets about them were sent to corporate buyers in Canada and abroad, and the wind was covered in newspapers and magazines across the country. As stated above, the goal of the Design Awards was to stimulate development, production, and visibility of excellent Canadian design ahead of the Centennial Celebrations and the Expo 67 World's Fair. Inuit art and design were highly visible at Expo, incorporated into the interior design of spaces such as the restaurant in the Canadian Pavilion and the model suites in Moshe Safdie's experimental housing project Habitat. Fabulous Geese by Anernik is seen here used as drapery in the background of an image of a children's art classroom uh, in the Canadian Pavilion. The image caption focuses on the easels and makes no mention of the drapery fabric. Ishibunkito's Birds in Flight was also used as curtains in the art center, faintly visible here in the background of a music class. 
And the fabrics were used to decorate some of the suites in the Habitat housing development that were open to the public as exhibits during Expo. The suites were designed by Barbara McLennan, a decorator service consultant from Chatelaine Magazine, using furniture and art donated and loaned by design companies and art galleries. Canadian Arctic producers supplied cave doors of fabrics which were used for drapes and bedspreads. Unfortunately, we don't have images of this so far, but here we can see Anukshu Akshu's many Eskimos print in the background, possibly used as a lampshade. Um, so interest in the fabrics was buoyed by the Canadian Arctic Producers Promotional Tour, the, the Design Awards, and their inclusion at Expo 67, as well as through marketing and exhibitions. Some examples of the venues the fabrics were advertised and displayed at in the mid-60s include the 1966 Cape Dorset print catalog, um, in a section that also advertised the annual calendar, postcards, and Christmas cards, um, the Canadian Arctic Producers promotional material, a spread on Inuit art in the Los Angeles-based magazine, uh, Designers West, and in Chatelaine Magazine's list of must-have centennial souvenirs. They were sold at galleries such as Snow Goose Gallery in Ottawa and featured in an exhibition and sale of Inuit art at Eaton's department store in Montreal in 1967. In the same year, an exhibition at the Winnipeg Art Gallery featured fabrics by Enernik, Ishihungito, Inukshuakshu, Fitziolak, Sharni, and two unknown artists alongside ceramics from Rankin Inlet promoting the fabrics and ceramics as two new forms of Inuit art. Around this time, the Eskimo Arts Council received several uh, inquiries from interior designers wanting to work with the fabrics and individuals looking to purchase them, demonstrating the impact of these efforts. Despite the promising response, the limited sales records that exist indicate that the fabrics did not sell well. And in January 1968, the print fabric printing department at Cape Dorset was abolished. Though fabric printing in Cape Dorset stopped at this point, new prints were still being designed by artists and were being, being printed in southern Canada. Printing in the south, in addition to the north, may have begun as early as 1966, but more research is needed. Much of the marketing and design of the fabrics promoted their use as drapery targeted towards architects, interior designers, and public works officials. This necessitated printing large quantities, which is not possible in the Cape Dorset facilities. Printing in the South enabled the co-op to meet demand and make sales, which benefited the Inuit artists who designed them. In the late 1960s, the de designs were also licensed out for other uses. One well-documented example is Toronto-based fashion designer Anne Gamble, who obtained the rights to reproduce artist designs for women's garments in 1968. Designs such as Pudlu spirits and birds were hand-screened onto fabrics to create jumpsuits coats, tunics, and suits. Her designs retailed for $175 to $500, and the artists who created the original designs received 5% of each sale. Photographs taken in Cape Dorset um, by Arctic ethnographer Norman Hallandy in 1968 show two Inuit artists, Kunoyuak Ashavak and Melia Jaw, wearing dresses made from the fabrics. Ashavak is wearing a dress with her own print on the sleeve. It's not yet known who made these dresses. Um, so these projects from the 1960s, late 1960s, represent another period of experimentation for the Cape Dorset fabric design, as they were licensed out to companies and designers for use in products ranging from fashion to luggage sets. In the early 1970s, co-op manager Terry Ryan asked Doug Mantegna, a textile print specialist, uh, based in Toronto to assess whether large-scale fabric printing in Cape Dorset was viable. Mantegna found that the logistics, chemicals, and cost made printing up north unsustainable. Shortly thereafter, Mantegna and Robert Eden founded a company called Inunu, which is under license from Dorset Fine Arts, to develop and sell Inuit graphic art designs interpreted into, interpreted into commercial textile products such as apparel and accessories. These images are examples of some of the earliest and new products, where the same designs from the pieces in our collection were used for cruise wear, men's shirting, and scarves. And also bedspreads, I guess. Um, promotional images were taken in Cape Dorset, and the knitwear designs were sold through Eden's. 
New fabric designs were developed in the following years. Uh, Mantegna would work from artist drawings, extracting and translating elements to create new designs that were approved by the co-op and the artist or their estate before being put into production. Ununu still exists today, translating in your graphic imagery into textiles such as scarves and most recently handmade carpets. Throughout the active years of the textile printing initiative, efforts were made to keep the project in Cape Dorset where it created jobs and income for artists and afforded them direct control over the products. However, the nature of the textiles and the way they were marketed made them incompatible with production in Cape Dorset, leading to the evolution toward the textiles now produced through Anunu. We are grateful for the opportunity we've had to study and research this collection thus far. Research will continue in anticipation of an exhibition in 2019. We look forward to welcoming members of the Inuit art community into leadership roles in the development of this exhibition and its programming. Thank you.